there's a new line of replicants made by Neander Wallace, and they completely obey. He designed a whole new breed of replicant. Fire. Much more advanced, much closer and similar to humans. They're high-functioning slaves. They're built to die and to be used for what they're used for, either a pleasure model or, I don't know, a Blade Runner. Don't you know what I am? You're not going to kill me, are you? One of the ways in which Nander Wallace has perfected replicants, he has upgraded the implantation of memories. Memories are created by humans, and they're given to replicants in order to provide some kind of context to their lives. It feels authentic. And if you have authentic memories, you have real human responses. In the world of the movie, replicants are seen as second-class citizens by humans. They perform a function that humans don't want to do anyway, and yet they're deeply resented. Because they're bioengineered humans, and they're not fully human. You've been getting on fine without one. What's that, man? A soul. In the first film, there was a void comp test which identified whether someone was a replicant or a human. Cells. Cells. What we have in our film is something else, which is a baseline test. The baseline is designed to test whether the effects of a Blade Runner's job are having an impact on his brain and his psyche. Cells. Cells. When you're not performing your duties, do they keep you in a little box? Humanity's curiosity about science and technology is something that really, at times, pushes boundaries. It's a story about what defines a human being, more specifically about memories. Are we humans without memories? I play a character named Kay, who is a Blade Runner. 30 years after where the first film left off, the profession of the Blade Runner is a little different and more complicated. He's a replicant police. <laughs> you know, he's a Blade Runner. It's my character's job to retire rogue replicants. The police department found that there was too much moral conflict with human beings killing replicants. So they designed a whole new breed of replicant just to be Blade Runners, and their sole purpose is to kill their own kind. He has to be at the service of people who dislike him or don't respect him. It's a good job. And in order to protect them, kill his own kind. You're not going to kill me, are you? Depends. What's your model number? In the world of the movie, replicants are seen as second-class citizens by humans. And then within the world of replicants, Blade Runners are sort of the lowest of the low because they kill their own kind. I just have some questions. What questions? A very bleak, lonely existence. Not a dream job by anyone's standards. Things have gotten a lot worse. The environment has become toxic. The world has gone through a lot of trauma and just barely made it. Everyone remembers where they were at the blackout. 10 days of darkness. Every machine stopped cold. When the lights came back, we were wiped clean. Every bit of data, gone. You get introduced to Neander Wallace, and it just blew my mind. I think Neander Wallace is like Elon Musk if Elon wasn't such an underachiever. This is a guy who saved the world from starvation. We make angels in the service of civilization. That is how I took us to nine new worlds. What a gift, don't you think? For Mr. Wallace to the world. Tyrell Corporation has gone bankrupt at this point due to the chaos that came from the replicants that started to rebel. And so he buys Tyrell, and then he is the one who upgrades the technology and claims to have perfected replicant technology. We need more replicants than can ever be assembled. Millions so we can be trillions. To me, Neander is someone who's willed himself to power 
He's a genius. He's a bit of a madman, but I, I don't think that bad a guy. He's just trying to save humanity. Happy birthday. <laughs> Neander is a bit Machiavellian. If you have a problem, he will solve it. If you are the problem, he will solve that too. What was always wanting was a story that flowed naturally out of the first. Blade Runner 2049 is the extension of the original Blade Runner. Life on Earth has continued to be challenging because of the environmental issues that the planet faces. It's a vision of the future that's somehow grounded and real. I missed you, baby sweet. It was a day. One of the ways you know that people are a bit starved for connection is a very popular product is a digital companion. Let's dance. The doxies, they're built to be used for a pleasure model. Hello, hello, A-boy. Bibi's Bar, it's a new way of consuming sexuality where people are freely going there to meet new friends. Neander Wallace came along and he had certain inventions and patents which helped the manufacture of food in a cheap, efficient way. This is a guy who saved the world from starvation. Bon appétit. A lot of humans who can afford it have gone off-world. More and more investment has been made in off-world colonies and the technology to service the industries. The nickel is for the colonial ships, closest any of them will. Any of us is going to get to that grand life off-world. It's a vision of the future that I think is haunting. It's like a character in itself. Blade Runner 2049, it's the uh, same kind of color palette, but so made by another painter. <laughs> program, an app, that someone like Kay can afford. It's a little piece of stolen companionship. Joy's a hologram. She's designed to please every person's fantasy, whatever they want her to be. Everything that Joy says and does has been programmed for her, and yet the character of Joy starts to appear as though she has a sense of autonomy. I'm coming with you. We see different joys throughout the movie, but the joy we're following is the one with Kay. I missed you, baby sweet. Yeah, it's a very complicated relationship. They know it's not real, but they have agreed to play this game of having a normal life. Because Kay is so isolated and alone, he really uses that program for company. Would you read to me? It'll make you feel better. She makes dinner for him every day when he gets home. Dinner that is artificial, that doesn't exist. Bon appétit. He's asking her to be like a real human because that's what he needs. And through her attachment, she becomes real to herself. And her love for him becomes real as opposed to programmed. An emanator. So she escapes her own limitations, the digital limitations, and becomes totally real for herself. You can go anywhere you want in the world now. Where do you want to go first? And you're there, and you're feeling the rain in her body for the first time. Suddenly, she becomes like a little girl again, discovering this. And it's such a romantic scene. I'm so happy when I'm with you. The idea of an AI companion isn't so far off in the future. It was eerie, the idea that we would have a digital person. There was not a previous joy in the first movie. She is new, she's the future. You look like a good job. Denis 
really spent a lot of time making sure that everything felt functional. The tech in our movie is very much in the spirit of the tech of the original film. So we have a lot of technology in our movie that is futuristic but also analog. It's tactile. It was a lot of design on, on getting the cars right because I know that was a big deal in the first movie too because cars are such a big part of our lives. The pilot fish is like a digital sidekick to K. It lives in the back of a spinner and comes out and it hovers like a drone. He'll say, watch the car, and it'll come up and watch the car. Just photograph everything. And it can photograph and give information back. Now let's have a look at you. The barracudas are more like an extension of Wallace. It's how he can see. So when the knee implant is put in his head, all of a sudden, these sort of motorcycle gang of little drones come in, can analyze things. We tried as much as possible to create the vehicles, all the props, in order to make that world as real as possible. 